Today, we are going to make a traditional mead that's going to end up being turned into a juniper elderflower mead, which I'm really, really excited about. But to get started, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of mead and why it's not really around so much anymore. I can't tell you how many times I'll mention to people you know, that I brew mead or I make mead or I'm going to a meadery and they're like, what, meat? A, a meatery? No, that's called a butcher. I just took a few notes. Uh, all of the information that I got was from this book, Wassail in Mazers of Mead. There's a couple of recipes in the back, but most of it is just the history of mead and the role that it's played through the ages. One of the biggest questions is which came first, mead or beer? Within a similar time frame. Uh, a lot of people will say that mead came first because of our very early relationship with honeybees. The oldest written script about mead is in the Vedas, which is a sacred Hindu text that is about 5,000 years old. Pretty incredible. But I do need to say that mead has been seen in archeological sites up to around 10,000 years old. And then of course, you know, the most famous peoples who had mead are gonna be the Norse. So you see a lot of Viking meads out there. And then uh, also within the ancient Greek societies, ambrosia, nectar of the gods much. So the reason that mead kind of fell out of favor, it all comes down to money. Really, with cities becoming more populated, access to wild bees became scarcer back in the day. In order to extract honey, people would have to destroy the entire hive. And really when all of this came to a head was in the Tudor period. At that time, honey was just too expensive for anyone who wasn't a noble or, you know, someone who was rich, really. All right, so enough about that let's get to it traditional mead what is it pretty much just honey water sugar for the most part however honey is a complex sugar and it is a little bit more difficult for yeast to break down so there are some different methods that people will use to add nutrients to their mead raisins comes to mind. A lot of people will chop up raisins and add them to mead. It does add some nutrient. Um, I do have here, this is boiled uh, black tea and orange. I made fresh orange juice and I also boiled um, the skin, the peel. So there is some nutrient in this. I am also going to, just in case. Now, for most of my meads, I have not used any added nutrients. I get a little bit paranoid. <laughs> And I wanna make sure that my yeast don't get stressed and have enough food to continue on and do their things properly. So there's something called Fermate O, which is Go Firm Protect. You add a little bit of this, about a teaspoon to your yeast in water, kind of rehydrate it in that, it helps protect it. Fermate K is the actual food. It's recommended to actually add this after there's been some fermentation going to kind of just add a little boost. So you might be thinking, well, what did, you know, the ancient Vikings and the Greeks do for yeast nutrient? They would reuse what's called the lease. So after things have been fermenting, there'll be this nasty level of sediment at the bottom. And it's just kind of a blend of things, you know, if you had fruit in here or whatever, there's gonna be some chunks of that down there. Also, there's gonna be a lot of yeast die off as well as some living yeast. So something that you can actually do is you can take the lease and reuse it. Now within that lease, all those dead yeasts, living yeast will eat them. Yeasts are a little cannibalistic, I guess. Something else I like to note is I don't like to boil my honey. Some people do, some people are, you know, really worried about the introduction of wild yeast into their meat. Our controlled yeast strains are so strong that they're going to just easily overpower any possible wild yeast that could contaminate your brew. When you boil honey, you take away a lot of the flavors, all the subtle complex flavors within the honey. It all goes away. So I don't, I don't want to risk that. You know, I, I want that full profile. I want my mead to be as rich, I guess, as it can be. So you do want to rehydrate your yeast about, I don't know, 
10 to 15 minutes before you pitch it. I'm gonna get started here and I'm gonna add my toasty warm orange water. And there's definitely some chunks of oranginess in there. For rehydrating your yeast, you do want the temperature of the water to be about 95 degrees. It just helps wake up the yeast, get some going. I don't want this to be too hot and I also don't want it to be too cool. <laughs> I have a thermometer, I should probably go get it. Sanitize my thermometer. How hot are you? That's hot enough. Please be hot enough. We're still not hot enough. It's like 80. <laughs> All right, well, I ain't gonna use this orange water then. I have a fancy filtration system. So that is the water that I am using. All right, I'm gonna start putting in some of my honey while I'm waiting for more water to become available to me. I like to just try out some different brands of honey. I always look for something that is you know, like straight from an apiary. It's like not Kroger brand or something like that. You know, like I want to purchase directly from a farmer or an apiist, a apiary person. This is the first time that I have tried this. This is Sleeping Bear Farm Star Thistle Honey. It comes from Northern Michigan. Uh, Star Thistle Honey has a fine, luscious flavor and an exquisite, silky smooth finish. Ooh. Uh, just from the description of this honey, I was like, hmm. This might be like really good in what I'm making. So this this is a full three pounds of honey right here. And I'm gonna use this entire thing. You know what? I'm just gonna start that now. Hopefully I don't make a complete mess. I don't have much faith in myself though. I'm gonna make a mess. Okay, let's see how well I can pour this. I'm a little bit nervous. Ah! Oh no. Oh, ah! uh, okay. <laughs> Oh, it's so pretty. Do, 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 do. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous? I need some toasty warm water now. I'll be back. And I should get all of this honey. So pour that in there. We've got this little thermometer on here. And uh, it warmed up. <laughs> warmed up so much that it's not reading the temperature. Something else that we absolutely need to do, have to do really, is we have to aerate the must, which involves about five minutes of shaking. Now for the yeast, I am using Lalvin D47. I believe the mat ABV for this is something like 14%, which is perfect. And what I'm going to do, because I'm only making a gallon, one of these packets can feed up to five gallons. I'm just gonna pour about half of it in. I'm gonna add my go firm. What do you want? No, you can't come up here. No kitties allowed. All right, I'm just gonna let that sit there and hang out. Sanitize my hand because I have to hold this thing down with my thumb. Shake the bejesus out of this. Oh, a minute later, I still have like four more to go. The whole point of shaking this is to introduce oxygen into the must. You need to add oxygen in the very beginning uh, to help feed the yeast. Later on in the process, of course, when there's alcohol in here, you don't wanna add oxygen because then it will oxidize and turn your brew into vinegar. And we don't really want that. <sighs> There's some oxygen in there. I also have water now, thankfully. This yeast is nice and frothy looking. I'm a little nervous to use this cup, so I'm just gonna do that. All right, I'm gonna fill this up just a little bit more. That looks pretty safe. Time to shake it up a little bit more. <laughs> My favorite thing to do is shake. Ah, 
Y'all, one thing I forgot to do. Besides make more mess. <laughs> I need to take a gravity reading. This is very important so we can get some idea of what the alcohol tolerance is going to be. Usually you wanna do this before you introduce yeast, but you know what? Whatever. This is nice and sweet, y'all. I need a pen. Starting gravity, 1.110. Classifies itself as a dessert wine with a potential to be about 15-ish percent. It is important to have a hydrometer when you are brewing. A, you get to see, you know, what your alcohol percentage is going to be. B, it is uh, really good at letting you know when your brew is finished. I'm wondering if I should add just a little bit more water. I'm really pushing it, I'm really pushing it. Okay, you gotta be careful. You gotta make sure you leave enough headspace because when this thing gets going, it's gonna like out the top. All right, so I put that on. I get my airlock. So I use sanitized water for this, just in case any little bugs or anything get inside, it'll kill them. In a couple of weeks or so, we will revisit this. Really, it depends on how much it's bubbling. In primary, you're getting a lot of bubbles. Once it hits secondary, the bubbling gets way, way lower, or it basically just dies off entirely. And that's when we're gonna add the juniper berries and the elderflowers. Thank you so much for joining me on this adventure. I'm not sure if I explained everything or not. There's so many like little bits and pieces to brewing and I myself am still pretty new at this. I've only been brewing since December. It's very exciting, I'm obsessed. And I hope that you try it out as well. All right, thank you, bye.